Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change, and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons, and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook, which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous, and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank, and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the two-day webinar on Women and Power, Gender Within International Relations and Diplomacy. 
jointly organized by Indian Council of World Affairs and the South Asian University, New Delhi, to discuss, deliberate, and debate on various facets of gender within international relations and diplomacy. ICWA and SAU has taken this opportunity of bringing together eminent scholars, academics, and practitioners from across our country. Over the next few Welcome our distinguished participants and our audience who have graciously accepted our invitation to attend this webinar. Before we begin, some housekeeping rules. Uh, all speakers and panelists are requested to mute themselves when not speaking. Questions will be taken during discussions in Q&A session. Panelists can ask questions to speakers through raise hand options. Questions can also be asked uh, by typing through the chat box. These will all be visible to the panelists. Questions in case you're facing connectivity issues, you may switch off the camera and continue on audio mode. We, we will now begin with the opening and the first session of the webinar. EGICWA, Dr. TCA Raghavan will deliver his remarks, followed by Professor Chaturvedi, Professor and Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, Department of IR, South Asian University, and Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, former Assistant Secretary General UN, and Deputy Executive Director UN Women, who is also the chair for the first session. May I now request Dr. T.C. Raghavan, DGICWA, to kindly deliver his remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi, Dr. Nabila Sadik, Dr. Seema Narayan, Dr. Somita Bose, uh, dear colleagues, uh, wonderful to be here with you uh, this morning uh, at the inaugural session of this webinar on women and power. Uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs is India's think tank. It is devoted to the study of international relations and foreign affairs. The Council's premier objective is to try and provide an India-wide platform which is open for debate, thinking and research on foreign policy uh, issues. And because we are a publicly funded think tank, both being open as also being India-wide are critical elements of the endeavor to implement our mandate. My colleagues in the Council have observed that the idea of gender within the ambit of international relations and diplomacy needs to be given serious thought as part, as part of the ICWA's mandate. This has come about as an inevitable follow-up to the discussions taking place in India today about women and development, women and politics, and most of all, the space available for two women in India today. The objective of this webinar is therefore to discuss how ideas of gender shape and are shaped by global politics and how does gender feature the contemporary diplomatic agenda with regard to Indian foreign policy. This two-day webinar, webinar is being held in collaboration with the South Asia University, New Delhi. We are delighted that this fruitful cooperation has emerged from uh, only a recently concluded MOU between our two institutions. Five key theme, themes run through the two-day webinar, uh, and these are gender debates, international relations and diplomacy, gender and international right, human rights discourses, gender development, national relations, gender security and international relations, finally, gender, culture, and soft power. There has been uh, a growing recognition in recent decades of the interconnected nature of gender inequalities, women's empowerment, globalization, climate change, environmental degradation, poverty, gender-based violence, and other phenomena. Uh, the idea of women uh, taking a prominent space in determining foreign policy and international relations has long captured imagination. However, the actual picture is of institutionally trained, highly skilled men discussing various facets of international relations and foreign policy. Most of the key players in international relations, 
such as diplomats, policy makers, heads of government, and academic professionals have been and still are men who come from patriarchal, social, and political backgrounds. As a result, discussion within IR or the study of women's roles in international relations remains largely constrained. Now, each of these four or five preceding sentences, uh, which I just read out, uh, is true, but it is also the case that there is a substantial qualification uh, required. And certainly that qualification has to be made without sliding into a kind of complacency or at the same time uh, looking at the other end of the spectrum by being hypercritical. In India, women have frequently and often taken the, low, taken the lead in both bilateral and multilateral fields in our diplomatic effort. I do believe that the presence of Ambassador Lakshmi Puri in this inaugural session and to start the proceedings of this conference will enable us to reach the right balance and conclusions as we debate highly difficult and contentious questions about the issue of uh, gendered, a gendered approach to diplomacy and foreign policy. Ambassador Lakshmi Puri's uh, career has comprised both a vast experience of bilateral relations as equally one of working in major international institutions like the UN. So she will give to us a perspective both from the inside as also from the outside looking in. Uh, may I therefore thank you very much Ambassador Puri for joining us uh, today uh, because we do feel that your perspectives will enable this conference to strike just the right note in its opening uh, session. The idea of gender equality lies at the heart of feminist foreign policies. This is best captured through two goals. One is gender parity, which symbolizes increased opportunities for women in leadership positions and their contribution to the conduct of IR, diplomacy, and diplomatic negotiations. And secondly, and this is equally important, a foreign policy that is gender sensitive, a foreign policy that contributes to alleviating gender inequality. A gender sensitive utilization of developmental partnership or aid budgets is only one example of a foreign policy, of a feminist foreign policy in operation. Uh, we in the ICWA are looking forward to two days of very fruitful uh, deliberations. I most sincerely wish to thank both on my own behalf as also on behalf of my colleagues who have worked very hard at uh, conceptualizing uh, and then uh, implementing a certain uh, concept of uh, this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. And with this, I would uh, request uh, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi, uh, who has been uh, our knowledge partner along with his colleagues in devising this uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your remarks. May I now request Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi to give his opening. So, unmute yourself, sir. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Raghun, uh, for uh, these welcoming remarks and very kind, generous words that you have that we have spoken. Uh, Ambassador Rashmi Puri, uh, Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs, Ambassador Raghun, Excellencies, dear scholars and students from various institutions of higher learning, I'm sure many of them are watching us alive. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the South Asian University and on my own behalf as the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, I too would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this seminar on women and power, gender within international relations and diplomacy. We feel truly honored to be the co-organizers of this webinar. And we simply cannot thank ICWA and the Director General enough for giving us this opportunity. The theme and sub-themes of the conference are also of great value and relevance 
to the Department of International Relations at SAO, both in terms of teaching and research. And it goes without saying that they also serve very well the overall vision of the South Asian University, which also talks about knowledge without borders. At SAO, we are trying to create a regional consciousness. I would like to acknowledge the presence and contribution of two of my colleagues who are at the forefront of gender research cluster in the department of IR, Dr. Shweta Singh and Dr. Samita Basu. They have also contributed, as Ambassador Raghavan very kindly said, to the conceptualization uh, of the seminar. When we look at some of these continuities uh, in the long history of global transformation, it has been very rightly pointed out by some scholars that gender relations remains one such continuity, which within the broadly patriarchal societies and structures and economies, as Professor Barry Buzan and George Lawson will point out that Indeed, Victorian society in particular and colonial society in general reinforced gender differences through powerful practices and rhetorical tropes. In other words, the decolonization of imagination will not be complete unless and until it comes under the critical gaze of gender interventions. There is also a good deal of scholarship addressing the question of how and why gender relations remain dismally unequal across world history. Two Swedish scholars, uh, Agenstman and Towns, have edited a book which I found very fascinating entitled Gendering Diplomacy and International Negotiations. And I'm very tempted to quote from this book, from the very introduction. Quotation begins, one of the most striking patterns of contemporary diplomacy is the over-representation of men and the gross underrepresentation of women in senior diplomatic and negotiation positions. While this may reflect the highly gendered character of diplomacy as an institution, this pattern also matches wider trends in global politics. Despite significant inroads of women into a number of public political spheres in recent decades, statistics still reveal a grim picture of inclusive political representation and gender equality. However, they do add, this bleak picture is changing, however, unquote. They also raise a number of very interesting questions. Some such questions are, where mm -hmm. are the women located and positioned in contemporary diplomacy and international negotiation? And I'm reminded of, say, for example, climate change negotiations or the knowledge production that is taking place within the banner of IPCC. To what extent diplomatic norms and practices of negotiations are gendered? To what extent the practice of diplomacy and international negotiation changes groups of diplomats with a broader and more diverse group of diplomats? And they certainly talk about a very important notion, gender justice in diplomacy, which particularly in the context of Global South intertwines with the notions of social justice, environmental justice, and so on. Critical geopolitical perspectives on the theme of this conference, Women and Power, would insist on relentless interrogation of politics behind the production of geographical knowledges and its power and its dominant spatialities. Carolyn McGregor, in a seminal contribution to the Journal of Indian Ocean Region, has argued Whereas the concepts of class, poverty, and race make regular appearances in social scientific analysis of global climate change, the same cannot be said for gender. Her basic argument is that we do talk about, uh, there is a good, great deal of literature which talks about the adverse impacts on women and children. So there is, a, there is an acknowledgement of this very important gender dimension. But what is not being taken into account is, as she argues, that the development of a deeper gender analysis where materialist informed empirical research happens on women. This is, of course, as I said, this is being, this is being covered uh, by, by some literature. But the gendered nature of knowledge production 
about the Anthropocene and climate change demands and deserves further closer attention and critique. So we find that since early 90s, a new generation of scholarship has addressed matters of feminist perspectives on war, peace, and specifically the academic discipline of international relations. A similar confrontation between traditional scholarly issue areas, baskets of issues, and gender sensitive analysis within critical geopolitics is something which is now being increasingly acknowledged by scholars of international relations and, geo and critical geopolitics. To quote Professor Simon Dolby, investigating the gendered assumptions in the study of international relations and foreign policy, in addition to more explicitly geopolitical reasoning, shows how political specializations render women vulnerable and one can add invisible uh, to this, uh, this particular argument. I would like to conclude, Madam Chair, with, uh, with, with something which I really found very fascinating while going through a recent issue of the Polar Journal. And uh, this particular article by Morgan Sieg clearly shows that we, when we look at these new frontiers of diplomacy and international relations, such as polar region and outer space, two areas in which I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested, uh, we also find something very interesting. So please allow me to, to quote and then uh, conclude. She says, I quote, in 1983, 1983 was a year of firsts for women in two of the world's leading institutions of scientific exploration. NASA sent a woman into space for the first time and the British Antarctic Survey, BAS, sent women to Antarctica for the first time. But by 1986, while female astronauts had continued to launch into space, women remained barred from applying to nearly three quarters of buses advertised positions. An author writing in the geographical magazine expressed frustration, quoting, if women can go into space, they can certainly do fieldwork in Antarctica, unquote. The director of BAS expressed a different sentiment. Within quotation, two no valid parallels can be made with space flight. Using the overlapping histories of BAS and NASA as a starting point, Morgan Say offers a very fresh way of thinking through the relational trajectories of Antarctica and outer space. She draws upon hundreds of previously unexamined records in BAS BAS archives as well as recent literature dealing with gender at NASA demonstrating the value of this research lens to shed new light on relational histories and gendered spatialities. This approach grounds our view of Antarctica and outer space in histories of gendered labor. It also contributes to growing critique of frontier exceptionality by illustrating the historical entanglements of Antarctica and outer space with broader processes of gendered change." Unquote. The IR Department of SAO would like to see more of this search being undertaken by its scholars. We look at this webinar both as a catalyst and inspiration in this direction. And as I said, we are extremely grateful to ICWA for this opportunity. And it's a great honor, Ambassador Puri, to have you in the chair for this particular session. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi. May I now request Ambassador Puri to give her opening remark, ma'am. Thank you very much. My video on. Thank you very much. Dear Ambassador Raghavan, I already declared you a he for she for convening this. And Professor Chaturvedi, distinguished panelists and participants from India and South Asia. I'm pleased that the prestigious to institutions under your leadership is gender mainstreaming its strategic policy universe. I applaud it as a feminist, a practitioner of international relations and diplomacy for 45 years, and more especially as someone who had the privilege of nurturing UN women, which I consider the first and only feminist global governance agency for seven out of its 10 years. It does not require a feminist to highlight, as the historian Yuva Noah Harari has done in his Homo sapiens series, 
that the power hierarchy of supreme importance in all known human societies over the ages is the male dominated hierarchy of sex or gender our families communities societies economies countries and international relations suffer to a greater or less extent from the almost atavistic patriarchal paternal syndrome of gender injustice and discrimination against women while we seek its rectification we need to dismantle the deepest civilizational foundations and what better way to do that than to leverage the united nations is it not first and foremost the keeper and shaper of our evolving equity based civilizational values through the 21st century i believe that the un act 75's major achievement is as the fountain head head of gender equality norms and gender debates in international relations it can be credited with taking the personal to political feminist dictum to its logical conclusion and it's been most influential in the incorporation of global norms on gender equality and women's human rights in national policies but also in diplomacy and foreign policy of member states and i will illustrate all of that the un has driven a virtuous cycle and a feed in and feedback loops from global regional national and local norms laws policies and their implementation with member states and with its feminist collaborators now although feminism arose in the west india and our south asian region has a rich tradition and panoply of women's movement and homegrown feminist thought and political leadership and experience and role models south asian feminism has contributed majorly to the significant body of gender equality norms standards soft law and international rules of the game especially at the united nations and i want to pay a tribute to all of you equally feminist theories have found voice and validation dynamism and traction in and through the un at the global level the very concept of gender mainstreaming is a case in point and i'm going to come to that later gender sensitivity mainstreaming all of that and there is in fact an international new international feminist order emerging at the un especially in the last 10 years resisting misogynist backlash now what are the elements of these order feminist theories of international relations are well reflected in the gender interpretation of international relations global governance and the multilateral system anchored in the united nations by now all four projects of the un for humanity have been gender mainstreamed peace and security human rights sustainable development and all its environmental and other dimensions humanitarian and disaster response a systematic and substantial uh, gendered lens is now there in the international community's efforts in conflict prevention peacekeeping peace building preventing and countering violent extremism and terrorism among, among others the women and women peace and security agenda enshrined in the landmark un security council 1325 resolution of 2000 and 10 other resolutions have become an integral part of un peace architecture and operations similarly uh, there is a gendered international political economy and development resonance in the un as a former uncad uh, advocate i believe development advocate i believe that the center periphery and dependency theories are applicable beyond post colonial north south economic inequality matrix in another extension of the personal is political marginalization ideas these theories capture the grossly inadequate and unequal participation and leadership of women in national and international economy trade aid finance business and employment as acknowledged in the addis ababa action agenda on financing for development of 2015 and its recommendations to remedy that now all of these have been very involved in engendering so i'm just uh, wanting to highlight them to address this gender equality has been center staged in the un and the bwis in the in in their development template through the universal gender responsive agenda 2030 for sustainable development 
that sets out 17 SDGs encompassing economic, social, and environmental targets for humanity, including a transformative SDG 5 on gender equality, and uh, with and 11 SDGs have gender responsive targets. And I think we can take credit for this uh, achievement. As our panelists are going to say, uh, there is the variable that, uh, that uh, international uh, 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 relations theories can be justified in terms of gender equality, the variable geometry, turbocharging of the variable geometry of uh, uh, in internationalism, whether it's idealist or whether it's uh, realist or constructionist, all these principles, uh, gender equality is both a principle and uh, um, um, very much uh, it is uh, a real hard power and soft power. And therefore, is it not there that we have now recognition in the global context, in international uh, uh, relations, that there is a critical relationship between both the principles and the hard power uh, uh, aspects of the four projects of international um, of, of international relations and the public goods it delivers. Historically, almost since UN's founding, a dedicated commission on the status of women, CSW, as an organ of the ECOSOC was established in 1946. It became the unique global platform for policymakers and feminist activists to dialogue and set feminist global standards for member states to follow. It spawned the landmark CEDAW, a Women's Bill of Rights, acceded to by 187 out of 193 countries, with governments regularly reporting to the CEDAW committee and holding themselves accountable. And then implementation of these provisions around the world is a major uh, way of uh, incorporating it in international relations. Four world conferences on women from 1975 to 1995, the last adopting the Beijing Platform for Action, have been held. 25 years old this year, the BPA, as we call it, has 12 areas of concern and action women and poverty, economic empowerment, power and decision making, eliminating violence against women, education, health, media, uh, institutional uh, uh, institutions, then uh, women in armed conflict, environment, human rights, and the girl child. So these are very comprehensive and it still constitutes a feminist uh, gold standard and a blueprint for governments and stakeholders to follow in their national and international uh, policy. Now, most countries have based their gender equality uh, policies on BPA and participated in the quinquennial national, regional, and global reviews, one of which has just been completed. UN Women has become the fulcrum of the new international feminist order, and this is what I want to emphasize. Its creation in 2010 elevated and intensified gender equality related global discourse, international relations and diplomacy. And I want to talk in terms of indigenization of feminist discourse, talk of six qualities or shadguns of excellence. Since we talk about uh, feminism and how do you integrate. The first guna relates to the creation of a UN women centered gender equality, global governance, and institutional architecture, a locus of what I call Shakti. It is more integrated, strengthened, multi-sectoral, and equipped to promote gender equality in a focused and comprehensive way than any other in history. It is an access for empowerment and dialogue among women's affairs ministries and machineries and a catalyst for engendering all key institutions everywhere, public and private, including foreign ministries. UN Women is also a repository of and radiates the other five gunas, the second guna, Bala, which is the quality of force multiplication, as I would call it. 
UN Women and its UN system coordination function has ensured that gender equality and women empowerment policies and programs and accountability frameworks are embraced by almost all 68 agencies and departments of UN system, including IMF, World Bank, and the WTO. These together constitute a gender equality infused universe measuring impact on delivering their global public goods, whether health or education, to women and girls, whilst igniting their empowerment and agency. Another important commitment is to gender parity in UN at all levels, from recruitment to top leadership of women. The third guna, which I call virya, is the quality of transformative and brave new global norms and standards. Apart from transformative, apart from BPA, the gender equality motherboard of standards have been strengthened through landmark resolutions of CSW, UNGA, ECOSOC, UN Security Council, CDOC Committee jurisprudence, expanding and deepening gender equality body of soft law and practice, including SDG 5. SDG 5 itself sets nine targets on ending violence, recognizing, valuing, sharing, and provision of unpaid care, unpaid care work, access ownership and control of economic resources, technological empowerment, sexual and reproductive health and rights, participation and leadership in economic and public life and decision making, and comprehensive legal and policy reform to end, uh, to end gender based discrimination everywhere. Now, key global agreements from Rio Plus 20, Paris Climate, New Urban Agenda, WSIS, Sendai Disaster Response have additionally been all engendered. Now, a veritable, ideational and normative gender equality compact among states, private sector and civil society, which is comprehensive and transformative exists. But we need to continue to push the frontiers especially in culturally contested areas. I think you referred to contestation and to develop the normative of implementation in every old and new field, including governance of digital and tech, tech economy 4.0 and the future of work. The fourth guna, Aishwarya, is mobilizing actors and assets to advocacy, movement building and multi-stakeholder partnership with the feminist movement. It is about deploying the power of game changers for gender equality. Youth, men and boys, media, private sector, religious group, other CSOs with women's movement, but also academia very clearly. Gender equality is a psychosocial enterprise as much as a political and economic one. These, therefore, all these societal, all of society convergences are very important for dismantling harmful practices and social norms and structures that stubbornly prevent rapid gender equality transformation. Examples of UN Women International advocacy campaigns joined by stakeholders globally include the successful He for She campaign, Step It Up for Gender Equality, Planet 5050, Unstereotype, Gender Equality Now, Ring for Gender Equality uh, in Stock Exchanges, Women's Empowerment Principles for the Private Sector, and Interfaith Alliance for Gender Equality. The fifth guna is Sarvagyan, the quality of omniscience. UNN Men has been working to be one-stop center for gender equality related information, knowledge, and wisdom to use T.S. Eliot's hierarchy of knowledge power beginning with bridging the gender data gap that is making women count to uh, is vital to continue to make the case for why gender equality matters for national interest and foreign policy. What does it constitute in different areas and sectors and how can countries articulate and organize themselves to get to that destination, becoming the best practices treasury to draw from on what works, what does not is important. Uh, a global observatory and gender equality related knowledge exchange for R&D platform has been the ideal with national partners like India, who can also be regional cooperation leaders in this respect. Now, traditional feminists have balked at the instrumental argument for gender equality uh, and for uh, including and, and in fact, for that matter, working with the private sector. 
the mindset change in political corporate leaders or public opinion makers we need to make we need to highlight both the right thing to do because it is gender justice and the smart thing to do because it serves actual economic democratic and effective governance and profit purpose and therefore you know these 12 to 18 trillion uh, increase in gdp by 2025 a gender parity case made by mckinsey nearly a billion increase in gdp by, for india by 2025 up really powerful arguments and corporate uh, profitability arguments the penny literally drops and as amartya sen argues the economic and poverty eradication benefits of gender equality is a no brainer the sixth guna is tejas the extraordinary resource mobilization and increased impact of programs on the ground in cooperation with donor states and beneficiaries in core areas of gender equality complementing bilateral cooperation programs for women's empowerment in women's economic empowerment women peace and security uh, gender responsive budgeting uh, and and so on uh, investment in training and gender responsive diplomacy bilateral and multilateral capacity building for women diplomats including specialized areas that are key in any country's foreign policy including trade economic economic finance environmental and climate change was mentioned cultural social and technological cooperation disarmament peace making and peace building among others including women in second and third track diplomacy in mixed or discrete groupings as un women facilitated in many uh, conflict uh, theaters like and peace making theaters like afghanistan syria colombia these are some of our very intense uh, engagements and in g20 women's engagement group uh, all of which we were engaged in 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 um, operationalizing and creating it's not as a substitute to their being crucially at the main negotiating table but in a preparatory and reinforcing role and to give it depth this un based new feminist order has had a cascading impact on bilateral and plurilateral regional and international interregional diplomacy un women regularly tracks for example how increased head of state government championship of gender equality is reflected in un gs speeches going beyond the western world in asia pm abe of japan and president xi of china assumed high profile global champions role in partnership with un women and i was very uh, privileged to be associated with that in south asia prime minister modi as a he for she uh, and a champion uh, of gender equality and sheikh asina as planet 5050 champion have been notable in their global championship of gender equality and women's empowerment the climax of this mobilization by un women of the top mostly male leadership as was emphasized of all countries that is only 21 out of 193 have women heads around the world was the first ever global summit on gender equality in history that we organized with 70 heads of state and government attending 165 countries participating and making commitments to the implementation of the gender equality compact we couldn't have dreamt about it even a few years ago un women encourage countries pursuing a feminist foreign policy in the un in g77 a first in 50 years in bolivia i, I remember going there and you know pushing for this uh, ldcs tibs small island developing state g20 g7 oecd and in regional fora such as sarc asean cela etc feminist ideational templates entered bilateral and plurilateral diplomacy especially of nordics and eu with developing but also to some extent other western group countries with developing countries including as part of aid human rights economic diplomatic and security cooperation we encourage peer influence and bilateral cooperation programs to target gender programs for funding gender mainstreaming of transversal programs these are both necessary 
and gender, gender equality policy compliance as incentives vis-a-vis -vis beneficiary country. Sweden became the first country in the world to uh, declare a feminist foreign policy, applying the gender lens to all uh, policies and, and relationships throughout the foreign policy agenda. And with the three R's of rights, representation, and resources. Uh, then we have in my earlier avatar, then I cherished working with South Asian countries and India to uh, advance their national and international gender equality agenda. UN Women and Gendered SART programs, Gender Policy Advisory Group, we helped set it up and support it, and three-year action plans. Going forward, I would recommend these six gunas approach to advancing the gender equality agenda in South Asia, Indian foreign policy, and in their conduct of international relations, including in and with the UN. First, establish institutional focal points within the prime minister's office or president's office, foreign ministry, trade and economic ministries, and support that in other countries as part of part of South-South and South-North cooperation. Ensure women's equal representation and leadership in foreign policy institutions, in diplomatic missions and negotiations abroad as the best manifest, uh, manifestation of Shakti. Follow an all of ministry, all of government and all of society approach to gender mainstreaming of foreign policy in close coordination with the national women's machineries, ministries and women's organizations and support their global networking and exchanges. I often find that there is a disconnect. Third, foster data, knowledge and best practice hubs and networks, regional and global. Let there be osmosis between the strategic security and foreign policy community, academia and think tanks and the feminist ones. Fourth, Proactively support upgradation of the gender equality normative compact. Don't be conservative or defensive. Gender mainstream of progressive regional and global norms in international fora, including in new areas. Fifth, lead and support advocacy and movement building on gender equality and join global campaigns. Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao is an exemplar for others. He or she drew highest commitment in India and even a stamp was issued make targeted investments in and promote international bilateral cooperation and practical, scalable and replicable programs that act like lighthouses and demonstration models and invest in women's capacity building and training. India's ITEC South-South cooperation program, I had once the privilege to be there, can become an instrument of women's empowerment in partner countries. Now, uh, Gloria Stenheim, my feminist hero, famously said, don't think about making women fit the world. Think about making the world fit women. It's that transformation of the world, overturning millennia of old patriarchy and enabling empowered women to prevail that 21st century international relations and diplomacy must advance. The BBA plus 25 reviews and the World Economic Forum Mind the Gap Gender Gap Report raises alarms on slow and uneven implementation. At this rate, SDG 5 is not achieve achievable within this century. We need giant strides of change, not faltering steps. This requires the international feminist order and the global gender compact marshaled by the UN to work in symbiosis with bold, gender responsive political leadership and diplomatic leadership and feminist movement building and planet 5050 50 by 2030 is indeed humanity's most important transformational mission and now a goal of international cooperation too it must be addressed with a sense of priority and urgency and the covid-19 pandemic presents the right creative destruction moment to unlearn patriarchy we are unlearning so many things, but let's also unlearn patriarchy, reinvent a world fit for women in its true Narivadi feminist vision everywhere.
Thank you. I will now um, call upon a very distinguished panel of uh, speakers on this first uh, topic that we have on gender debates, international relations, and diplomacy. And uh, our first speaker is Dr. Nabila Sadi, who is assistant professor Tarojini Naidu Center for Women's Studies, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. And she is going to be speaking on gender and international relations, a theoretical framework. And she is going to highlight the underlying notions of feminist uh, international relations and how to give feminist sight to um, what she calls previously gender blind international relations. So, uh, Dr. Sadiq, you have the floor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, uh, ICWA and SAU for this, giving me this opportunity uh, to present before you my thoughts. So I'll be speaking on uh, gender and international relations, a theoretical framework. So um, I have basically divided my paper into two parts where in the first part, I'll be looking at the historical background which has been conducive to the emergence of feminist IR. And in the second part, I'll be looking at the various feminist approaches that had contributed to the field of IR. Uh, when we traditionally look at the area of international relations and world politics, most decision making has been done by men. And they have dominated public sphere since time immemorial, even from the times of Athens, etc. So international politics has been known as a man's domain. Uh, furthermore, when we look at the field of international relations, the subject of analysis in it has been the state. So issues like state security, national security, balance of power has been the domains of international relations. So uh, international relations gets associated with what is known as masculinity and militarism due to the patriarchal and male dominated nature of society. And therefore leaves no space for gender and feminist analysis. So feminists have criticized or critiqued the fact that this framework of international relations takes up only the issues of national security when they talk about security and ignores the importance of what is known as physical, individual or even human security that time. Uh, so gender issues have become, uh, became what is known as shrouded in obscurity in international relations. So it was only in the late 1980s that feminist analysis began to emerge in this field. And feminist international relations at that time developed in the works on politics of development, which was Vidvat and Gad, and in the peace research in the 1980s. Uh, uh, interestingly, there were certain historical changes and transformations which were happening in the world of global politics, which opened up the sp uh, space for fields which were not con considered as traditional in international relations. Firstly, there was the collapse of Soviet Union and the end of Cold War, which led to a new kind of world order. Secondly, there was uh, liberalization and globalization, which happened, which led to new social movements and identity politics to emerge, which necessitated cooperation and interdependence as more beneficial than confrontation. Uh, interestingly, confrontation or balance of power is seen as a masculine style of leadership and cooperation and interdependence is seen as a more feminine or women's style of leadership. So that gave space for feminism and women's style of leadership. Thirdly, um, with the importance which non-governmental organizations were attaining, transnational non-militaristic issues like environment, identity politics, sustainable development became the focus of international relations. So the time was very ripe for giving some space to studying issues of gender and women in the field of international relations. So feminist scholars at that time started by looking at how the core concepts of international relations were gender. So feminist knowledge criticized, analyzed and problematized many issues uh, associated with this field. According to feminists, the knowledge that was traditionally available or that was in the mainstream 
was based on experiences, memories, and visions of men, which made women very invisible in the working of the state, as well as the scholarship which was associated with studying the state. So they started by looking for women who were missing in foreign policy, in military, in diplomacy, and how that was related to gender inequality that existed in the social system. So feminist investigations revealed how gender was pervasive in all realms of life, but it was wearing a garb of what is known as gender neutrality. And by wearing that garb, about half of the population and its issues were not being addressed. So binaries and hierarchies which were existing in society were not just creating gender inequality, but was also creating power relations which were subjugating and oppressing many more humans than we know. So the, this culture of what is known as hegemonic masculinity and militaristic uh, nationalism was visible in international morality, which made not just women, but even transgender, homosexuals, blacks, and many more invisible and oppressed, which made a society extremely unequal. So uh, feminist scholars at that time looked at what is known as the gender blind approaches in IR, the international relations, and they did it, did it by uh, by doing two things. Firstly, they criticized international relations, foreign policy, and world politics to focus only on mili military security or national security. So they criticized the focus on national security and tried to bring the focus to individual or human security. So the most crucial debate in IR was uh, feminist IR was national security versus human security. Second thing they did was to politicize the everyday or what is known as personalist political as a very important factor. So they looked at the fact that how gender was affecting men and women, but, but it is also affected by them. So the differential effect uh, which uh, international relations had on um, men and women was affecting international relations also. So, for example, if there were more women who were in decision-making roles, then it would have affected how international relations and diplomacy is conducted worldwide. Hence, feminist scholars in IA started writing on a various areas of topic. They've written on security, which is like uh, Laura Schausberg, Sandra Whitewood. They've written on global governance. Penny Griffin, Shireen Rai. They've even written on nuclear proliferation. Carol Kahn has written, Sarah Roddick. Then they wrote of, on peace building, Elizabeth Porter, Half Shah. And then they've written on international law, uh, international political economy, development, etc. So what we realize is that there's been not, no single feminist framework to international. All of them are interrelated, but they also run in different direction. For example, one set of thought thing look at men and women as equal so deserving equal rights the second uh, train of thoughts celebrates the uniqueness and even see women as superior so uh, there are certain strands of feminism that started taking up what is known as international relations the strands which are uh, which i have discussed in this paper are basically liberal radical <laughs> marxist socialist postmodern and standpoint. So when you look at the emergence of feminist IR, you realize the liberal stand was the first school where the conversations about equal rights for men and women was raised. So that is why Cynthia Inclo talked um, yeah, about where are the women in politics in 1990s. Since international relations at that time was basically concerned with war, peace, security, and power, women were traditionally excluded from this man's work. So the question for liberal feminists was to concentrate on the underrepresentation of women in world politics and how to make them visible and valued. It's not just that they are not there, they are there, but they are not valued in that realm. That is why Enclo talks about how women were not absent but their contributions were not considered important or valuable enough when compared to those of men. So they existed as cheap laborers. They existed as prostitutes for military men. They existed as wives of diplomats, as spies, as domestic workers, as secretary. So they existed, but they were not the one who were making the decision. They were not in leadership position. So what liberal feminists seek to do is to seek greater inclusion of women in the public sphere in order to address the gender inequality uh, in society. And that would change international relations access. 
However, in doing so, what they forget to address is the structural causes, which fail to see the inherent masculinity and inequality in the present social system. So the, this same system was built on a base of women's exclusion and powerless. So that is one of the cons of what is known as a liberal feminist IR also. Secondly was radical difference or difference feminism, who saw that women can be more effective than men in conflict situations and group decision making. So their experiences, so they celebrated the experiences with nurturing and human experience to relate it to conflict situations. So they valorize this unique experience of women. And from this perspective, they criticize realism. Uh, the realist uh, theory as being the only or the f most effective way of doing uh, uh, foreign policy because there it was only about confrontation or balance of war or military. They said that uh, the whole idea of cooperation becomes important. The whole idea of group decision becomes important. And that is the feminist uh, style of leadership. So uh, what realism was doing is very masculine and it was focusing on only on individualism and ignoring the interdependence and interconnectedness, which could help international relations as a whole. Uh, the third school was the Marxist and socialist feminist theory. And Marxists are what is also known as materialistic, where the focus was on material and economic forces and how they have a role to play in the oppression of women. Here, Sandra Whiteworth looks at the material reality and uh, she looks at how material reality of a time or the what is known as the modes of productions of a time mix with the ideas about men and women and society during a particular time have an effect on institutional policy for example if you are in a capitalist or feudalistic world but the ideas about men and women see them as equal that would affect the institutional policy and make the society more, more equal so both things, even your material reality and your ideas about men and women affects your position in a society. Then there was socialist feminism, which saw a start, uh, which basically was probing the economic structures as not the only one which was responsible. So they were celebrating women's unique contribution in politics, but also understood that the social system in the sense of patriarchy needs to be changed apart from the material realities. So women face a disadvantage because of capitalism and patriarchal society. And that is where, where the ideas about gender and race comes in. And that is where postmodern feminism comes in. So postmodern feminism in IR was basically trying to do two things. One, it tried to deconstruct realism by uncovering the pervasive hidden influences of gender in IR. And so they saw that how wars were mostly waged and concluded by men and it was masculine. But there the women existed. They existed as spies, as workers, as a lot of important brains behind it, but they were not raising their voice. So what postmodern feminism thought was that women play an equal role in military and decision making also. On the other hand, because of these ideas about gender and race and the difference between men and women, uh, there was a gender division of labor which was happening. So certain works was uh, seen appropriate as women's work and the certain works were appropriate in men's work. So uh, a world it was creating certain kinds of soldiers and work that this kind of work has been done by V. Spike Peterson when she looked at global political economy and sees how the divide between men and women work led to women uh, earning much more less than men. Also, uh, such kind of work has been looked by Elizabeth Progel, who analyzes the treatment meted out to home-based workers in international law, which led to the ILO Homework Convention in 1996. Uh, the very important law school which has contributed to feminist IR has been standpoint feminism, which looks at the fact that knowledge is socially constructed. So this marginal position which women have in society is actually an advantage because that gives them access to knowledge which has been traditionally unavailable to the privileged class.
and they, uh, because this knowledge is or perspective is denied to those who benefit from subordination of women and that is why a very important thinker in our, uh, feminist ayah emerges which is jn tickner who reformulated hans mongenthal's principle of political realism from a feminist perspective and said that morganto was not wrong at the way he looks at national interest or when he uh, looks at balance of power etc but that is only 50% perspective of the world the other 50% he doesn't really talks about so the most useful point of departure for feminist ayer theory has been which has relied on socialist feminist insight and on sta- uh, standpoint feminism today when you look at the gender nature of i r u realize that they has been they would have been a enormous political and intellectual error which would be committed if we would have ignored that in international relations because the gendered understanding of international relations makes it more holistic and beneficial for foreign policy for security development and the social system international relations is also about uh, foreign policy it's about our dip- diplomacy it's about poli- policy making and a no- lot of things that affects its citizen so uh, it is seen as gender neutral but in its car by becoming gender blind it's affecting both the gender not just the women but even the men because in ir very often those women who make it to the top eclons of foreign policy or diplomatic life seem to have at times do not have an option but to adopt approaches and leadership style which is very similar to their male colleagues and which is masculine in nature and if that is happening then it makes international relations very restrictive because then it's giving very little space for the articulation of what is known as the female voice so this would make a uh, feminist uh, this would make international relations very essentialist so feminist ir me uh, would give that point of view of not making it essentialist and to give voice to the women the voice that will enable both men and women to articulate their causes their interests their aspirations and that voice needs to be amplified so and that amplification can come from numbers from uh, adequate representation for example if women constitute 50% of the population it is ob- obvious that the representation in professions and in leadership position should be equal or at least close to equal to that of men who are similarly placed women today are holding portfolios of defense foreign uh, affairs everywhere and so apart from holding those portfolios pra- uh, path breaking initiatives in independent inspirational feminist the- thinking is also needed in these sectors to to uh, truly transform them war are most often not started by women but at times they are the ones who are reconstructing the societies in the after effect so this say and their voice is extremely important in world politics they must be heard in national politics and their representation has to increase in consonance with the proportion of their population so in co- conclusion what i want to say is that if gender and international relations come together in the mainstream then it will have a positive effect in transforming policy uh, foreign policy public policy human development and the status of all genders thank you thank you so much uh, dr sadiq for that very comprehensive and um a very enriching um presentation making a, a really uh, irrefutable case for why gender must be uh, mainstreamed uh, into and is it as i was saying earlier also how the, it can turbocharge really uh, in a, in a, in a variable geometry sense every theory of international relation whatever wherever you come from whether it is a realist uh, perspective or any other perspective uh, a liberal perspective uh, every theory has a place and will be enriched by uh, gender equality uh, mainstreaming and also uh, as you rightly highlighted will make it more effective holistic and uh, achieving the human uh, uh, not only human security purposes but also all the as i as i mentioned earlier the human uh, humanity projects of peace and security sustainable development uh, humanitarian and disaster response and 
very much uh, human rights. Uh, so, uh, and uh, you have also highlighted what are the key areas um, or key ways of bringing the two together. And uh, this is something that's uh, going to also hopefully be taken into account by uh, the practitioners of diplomacy, but also those who are hopefully now reinventing uh, their uh, national and international uh, strategies on uh, in all of these areas, including due to COVID-19. Now, um, I would go, uh, now ask Dr. Seema Narayan, uh, who is the Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Desh Bandhu College, University of Delhi, to please speak on gender and international relations, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, in double whammy, uh, international relations, situating post-colonial feminism in the house of global IR. And basically, she's also looking at the basic theoretical frameworks of gendered international relations. And uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, Dr. Narayan, you have the floor. Oh. Uh, I'd like to thank ICWA first and foremost for inviting me and uh, uh, thank all the uh, other panelists as well uh, to be able to, uh, you know, get this opportunity to interact with all of you today. But I think after listening to all the earlier panelists, my work has really become easy because uh, a lot of what uh, I also had included in my presentation has already been covered. So what I'm going to do is skip one of, you know, one or two of those points. And uh, like uh, Ambassador Puri rightly said that we as theoreticians, you know, we look at categories and variables uh, and structures. So that's exactly what I'm going to do in my presentation. So thank you all. So I'll begin by problematizing my, uh, you know, the project of global IR, and then I'll see where I fit feminism and post-colonialism in the scheme of things. So the movement towards global IR is essentially a culmination of a critical movement evolving in the humanities and the social sciences, denouncing the existence of Western dominance over the worldwide production and dissemination of knowledge. In disciplinary IR, it has led to an investigation into its genesis and its relationship to theory. In its practice, as well as in theory, it has led to the interrogation of the disparity of power relations as manifested in the core periphery structure of the international system. The mission of global IR is to overcome the ethnocentric and Eurocentric limitations of the field of international relations by opening it up to the hitherto those that have been unrepresented in the scholarly publications in its theory building and research methods. Feminism with its interdisciplinarity as you know Dr. Sadiq was okay. just talking about, uh, intersectionality, mixed methods and receptivity to quantitative research is appropriately positioned to carry forward the project of global IR. And I'm going to skip the point about, you know, hegemonic masculinity, et cetera, which, ha which has already been covered uh, excellently by our previous speakers. The feminist critique of mainstream IR was directed at the silences of the discipline, particularly surrounding issues relating to gender, and how gendered relations affected global politics and the global political economy. Feminists claimed to bridge this gap by making gender a category of analysis in international relations. However, there were limitations of constructing gender as a binary oppositional category or an essentialist category that is seeing gender in terms of the biological or sexual difference. Uh, for example, the man versus women question. An essentializing construct of gender makes us understand gender as a natural category, which equates gender with women and gender as a category that uh, gets overlooked altogether, including the agency of men, masculinity and structures of patriarchal power. Uh, 
relationships in the social world. So therefore, only gender in a non-essentialist meaning and as a social construction informed historically by social, cultural, political and religious structures will unravel how gender and gender practices impact global politics or IR. This binary oppositional characteristic of gender roles assigned to women and men in the public and private domain not only privileges hegemonic masculinities but assigns greater social value to masculinities. The phrases man up, breadwinner and man of the house sum up these roles of men that are more valued. These unequal power structures prevail in social relations between men and women and privilege hegemonic masculinity while subordinating women and their attributes that are then less valued. While examining international relations and diplomacy through gender sensitive lenses, one finds that IR is not impervious to these unequal and hierarchical relations between genders. In fact, IR is a gendered, racialized and a masculine discipline. Those in the foreign policy establishments, whether advisors or strategists, are celebrated for their masculine characteristics like rationality, objectivity and hawkishness. Henry Kissinger and George F. Kennan were seen in this vein. Women in the corridors of power were validated for their manly traits and you know we can think of Mrs. Gandhi and Margaret Thatcher in, in, in that frame. Uh, the scholarship of IR focused on issues concerning the domain of high politics, order, conflicts and security, which prioritized war, broadly understood to exclude women. IR privileged hegemonic masculinities when it comes to theorizing on world politics. Uh, it therefore tends to exclude any other perspective that does not fit into its canonical Eurocentric and masculine structuration. Gender, race and other marginal groups remain hidden unless viewed from gender sensitive and racialized lenses. One of the most troubled engagements that feminism has with mainstream IR is about methodology. The claim of mainstream IR that knowledge is objective and is value neutral is an ongoing and an inconclusive debate in the discipline and the fact value dichotomy is significant. Positivists claim that true facts are value neutral and objective. Feminists are on the opposite side of the divide and refute the claims of mainstream IR's rational choice approach and echo their purported claim that knowledge cannot be objective and value neutral because it emerges from the re researchers researchers social context and identity in other words knowledge is subjective and a social construction unlike mainstream ir which is state centric uh, reductionist and a top down approach a feminist approach focuses on social relations among people and is about the study of everyday lives of the individuals and the social relations among people Knowledge emerges from political practice and can lead to social change. Therefore, knowledge can be emancipatory as well as transformative. Paradigm wars, therefore, have been raging since the 1970s and feminism has been firmly positioned within the interpretive paradigm, pursuing qualitative research. However, since feminism, feminist researchers have become uh, more pragmatic about methodology, with increasing digitization, uh, technological and interdisciplinary developments, empirical research is finding favor with feminist scholars and positive methods like surveys and theory testing, data analysis, experiments and other scientific methods are now routinely employed besides other approaches. Although resistance to, uh, to quantitative methods persists in feminism, these debates intersect with the wider debate in the social sciences about the development of methodologies that are appropriate for researching contemporary social, philosophical, cultural and global issues. Social scientists, particularly feminists, are concerned with capturing and analyzing the multiple complexities of social life. Within feminism, this is seen in the debates on intersectionality and presents the challenge of crafting methodological tools to weave theory with analysis of empirical data. This will help mainstreaming feminism into the IR discipline and bridge the methodological gap between them.
What most gender theories were not asking questions about were the interconnections between various social identities, be it race, gender, class, culture or sexual orientation. Intersectionality, a term coined by the black feminist scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, is a framework to analyze interlocking or overlapping systems of power that can combine to create both discrimination and privilege. It identifies the advantages and disadvantages felt by individuals or groups as a result of a combination of factors viewed through the prism of intersectionality. The violence and oppression against women cannot be analyzed without situating it in the historical context of colonialism, war and broader geopolitical, racial and economic processes. Intersectionality broadens the lens of feminism beyond gender mainstreaming to the historical misogyny of international political and economic processes in IR and questions those structures rather than merely adding women and stir. Now the uh, Interventions of post-colonial uh, uh, feminism's interventions can unpack the hidden power structures and dynamics of patriarchal dominance and colonial assumptions both in IR and in the debates on international uh, security. The security discourse in IR is not only patriarchal but chauvinistic, racial, colonial and premised on gendered assumptions of legitimacy and illegitimacy. While examining the security discourse in IR, post-colonial feminism sheds light on these dominant narratives as reflecting coloniality of power, gendered constructions in international relations as well as hegemonic masculinities. The use of four categories by, uh, by post-colonial feminists in the dominant IR narratives leading to leads to unraveling hidden power structures and exposes how the use of coded language, words and discourse can give meaning to and shape identity formation, making some more visible than others and without agency. The coloniality of power gets reproduced in the perpetuation of vertical nuclear proliferation within the nuclear weapon states, whereas the third world is deemed incapable. India's pursuit of nuclear weapons has been closely monitored by the US, who expresses strong concerns about political and technological maturity of India and their, in, uh, their ability to possess nuclear weapons safely. In a similar rendition of ethnocentrism in a nuclear debate on South Asia, Scott Sagan predicates nuclear instability to a lack of safety and irrational, uh, irrationality uh, prevalent in the new nuclear states. They question the economic capacity of the non-nuclear weapon states along with their intention, stability and trustworthiness. The feminizing and racializing of rogue states is another representation of colonial superi superiority and is unbridled within the nuclear weapons regime. The rogue state is often ascribed with seemingly feminized qualities like yearning or passion for nuclear weapons, which works out to delegitimize their nuclear concerns in favor of the masculine nuclear weapon states. The role of discourse analysis is very powerful in the creation and recreation of ideas of masculinities and femininities, particularly using words, language and their inherent assumptions. Therefore, gender discourses are important in as much as they play a role in the construction of national identity, appealing to feminized imageries in the invocation of nation states, examples the imagery of the motherland, recreates the image of a passive, pure and a sacred being that needs to be protected from invasion by the male foreigners. The discourse on nuclear weapons is gendered and hierarchical and states with nuclear weapons have greater power over states without nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapon states have been ascribed masculine traits of power and strength and are more valued, making it feminine or weak to discuss soft issues like disarmament, which is deemed less valued in the security uh, discourse. Men have dominated the security discourse and espoused militarized values in their readings of human history, war, uh, power and weapons. 
a militarized and masculinist discourse is ensconced within deep gender hierarchies and has eluded attempts at achieving sustainable development goals and gender equality. Feminism seeks to point out these knowledge gaps in the discourse and challenges assumptions that are, uh, you know, that are uh, uh, these knowledge gaps and challenges assumptions that value nuclear weapons, thereby bringing in conversations on human security, humanitarianism and uh, disarmament. And the last two categories that I want to talk about are with regard to Carol Cohen's work, uh, who argues that a very sanitized and a techno-strategic language, which is rational, gendered and scientific, is used around the nuclear discourse. This sanitized language, which is techno-strategic, opens a window of opportunity to analysts to deflect from the horrors of the nuclear holocaust. Masculinist imageries of bombs uh, penetrating the Mother Earth reify dominant forms of sexualization. Nuclear deterrence is presented as hegemonic masculinity on the template of global politics, while feminizing diplomacy and negotiations are seen as negative. The sexist discourse, according to Carol Cohen, uh, only reproduces the gendered hierarchies that exist in our day, everyday lives and by extension to global policies. Uh, therefore, it is important to understand issues like security, peace building and global political economy to unearth deeply entrenched and hidden knowledge systems. Uh, the last category that I talk about are the patriarchal constructions. The play out of the uh, father-son dynamic where the nuclear weapon state is the patriarchal father figure who thus has the legitimate power to intervene in the quest for of non-nuclear weapon states acquisition of nuclear weapons. The criticism towards India, Pakistan and Iran can be seen in this light. The quest of non-proliferation by the US is an endorsement of their patriarchal power, yet their failure to disarm highlights their colonial desire. The use of post-colonial feminism as a framework of analysis complicates this power dynamic and raises the important question of whose security matters. Its use of mixed eclectic methods, interdisciplinarity and deconstruction will go a long way in pushing forward the project of global IR. Inclusivity is not just about including other voices and difference, but also about methods, research design, the politics and coloniality of knowledge production and its dissemination. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, emphasis on uh, what I really found very um, important is your uh, characterization of the impulses, the masculinity and those hegemonic impulses behind international relations theories and, and understanding and practice and uh, the whole issue of how women and uh, their participation, their voice, their value and their issues and their security or their uh, human security to go back to an earlier reference, all of that is uh, uh, set aside or undervalued. Uh, so I think that's that's a very important basis for us to also argue, as you have done, that we need to uh, really uh, change that in a major way. And that mindset shift, that uh, theoretical shift as well as practical shift has to come about. Let me now go to our uh, Third and last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Shomita Basu. Uh, she is speaking on a subject which, uh, of course, I'm very uh, interested in, having actually for seven years uh, dealt with the UN Security Council and the engendering of uh, peace and security architecture, peace and security, peacekeeping, prevention, conflict prevention, as well as uh, in um, trying to see how the human self can be uh, a strong uh, catalyst for and a demonstration model 
for women and women peace and security implementation including on the ground so i'm very very keen to see uh, what uh, dr basu has to say on the gender dimensions of the united nations security council uh, she is uh, going to uh, of course uh, give a retrospective on what it means what uh, this whole agenda means um uh, the women peace and security agenda and uh, what could be the prospective indian role in it and i must mention that um, they already said 10 resolutions uh, plus there is the inform informal uh, uh, expert group which was also set up thanks to 21 22 then there was further evolution in 21 42 uh resolution un security council resolutions and this is also the 20th anniversary of uh the 1325 so very very important uh, debate this one dr basu you have the floor thank you ambassador puri and a very good afternoon to everyone joining us today many thanks also to icwa especially ambassador raghavan and dr datta who made this possible we at the south asian university as professor chaturvedi uh, noted are delighted to collaborate with icwa on this conference the distinguished panelists who have spoken before me have laid out some key conceptual some and international policy dimensions of gender and international relations allowing me the privilege to focus on a relatively narrow theme that is the gender dimensions of the united nations security council let me begin by addressing the question of why we should pay attention to the council in spite of it being so far away from our everyday lives here in india and we here are most familiar with uh, delhi's calls for reforming the council and in fact this persistent attention itself should indicate to us the importance of the institution whose primary mandate is the maintenance of international peace and security until two decades ago gender was barely mentioned at the security council this changed uh, with the passage of resolution 1325 on women and peace and security uh, in october 2000 and ambassador puri uh, made a number of references to the wps agenda The resolution introduced a new theme in the lexicon of the council and brought in somewhat radical ideas well radical for the council obviously not for the feminists who are recorded to have advocated these for almost a century so what are these ideas uh, some of them well that armed conflicts and peace processes are gendered that women's participation in peace making and peace building should be recognized and encouraged that women and girls have specific experiences of conflicts including as for instance refugees and combatants and that among others they are at high risk of being targets of conflict related sexual violence since 2000 the council has adopted nine additional resolutions on women and peace and security with the most recent 2493 adopted in 2019 Over the years a complex policy architecture has emerged around what's been called the women peace security or WPS agenda. There's a lot of feminist literature on this and there'll be papers on the uh, this particular agenda later today as well as tomorrow. My main point here is that the WPS agenda exists and its institutional home is the Security Council. So gender advocates need to account for the pros and cons of policies coming from the council and UN member states especially those on the council cannot but engage with an issue area that appears to be here to stay. So moving on from this background I offer insights into three gender dimensions of the council a feminist reading of the council as a multilateral body second emergence of the WPS agenda and third narratives on feminist foreign policy that are now reflected in the council's deliberation and these may be seen as preparatory notes for future pol foreign policy considerations relating to gender um as we know india is set to join the council next year so in conclusion i briefly outline some points on gender for the indian government to consider during its two year term 
Okay, on to the discussion of the gender dimensions of the Security Council. First, what does a feminist reading of the Council as a multilateral body entail? One aspect of this relates to the number of female and male representatives. As has already been mentioned, we do not see a lot of women in these spaces. But even when there have been relatively higher numbers of women, for example, a record number of six female permanent representatives were representing their countries in November 2014. The question is whether deliberations have happened differently due to this critical mass of women in the council. Now, as I note in a 2016 article, notwithstanding a shared acknowledgement of international sisterhood and the belief that women tend to approach their diplomatic work differently, all the female diplomats interviewed by the BBC's Nick Bryan for an article shared the view expressed by the Nigerian ambassador Joy Ogwu that we, and I quote her here, the female diplomats cannot feminize the national interest, end quote. I'm curious, of course, as to what feminizing national interest would mean and why it is a priori apparently not something to explore further. In any case, moving on to the second aspect of this feminist reading of the council is one that sees gender as constitutive. I will explain using two examples. First, the understanding of peace and security is gendered. Traditionally, the threats that the Council has dealt with primarily related to interstate wars. Since the 90s especially, it has focused on civil conflicts. Now, from a feminist perspective, armed conflicts are a part of continuum of violence. We can, for instance, look at women's insecurities, including threats of physical violence during times of peace. But this is not discussed. The Council can only accommodate a limited understanding of peace and security. And there's a lot of politics behind this as well, which we can uh, talk about in the Q&A session. Two, we can apply the concept of homosociality to diplomatic work at the Council. Emma Beerton Gunther defines homosociality and I quote her here, the preference of same-sex relationships that are not of romantic or sexual nature, but of social preference such as friendship or mentorship. He discusses in a book published last year that in peace negotiations, for instance, male homosociality has been, and I quote her again, expressed in how competence is defined and in the access to informal meetings which plays a role in reproducing men's overrepresentation in peace processes." End quote. It should then be possible to see how this kind of gendered power operates at the Security Council as well. I hope that these two examples indicate how at the Security Council, both the understanding of the problems to be dealt with and the efforts to find a solution are gendered. Before moving on to my second point, it is important to add, as many post-colonial feminists have, that gender forces are also already, among others, racialized. Thus, for instance, international interventions relating to gender may be seen as, in Gayatri Spivak's words, white men saving brown women from brown men. Now, against the backdrop of this feminist reading of the Council, I'll now discuss the second point, that is the evolution of the Women, Peace and Security, or WPS agenda, at the Security Council. I briefly mentioned Resolution 1325 and related policy architecture at the beginning of the presentation. While much can be said about the agenda, my focus here, as I said earlier, will be on its place in the work of the Council. Procedural matters aside, there are generally two types of resolutions at the Council, country-specific, for example, on Haiti or Lebanon, or thematic resolutions that provide a kind of normative orientation to the work of the Council. Traditionally, the themes have related to disarmament, non-proliferation, and terrorism. Since 1990, we see, 1999, we see a host of newer themes relating to protection of civilians in armed conflict, children in armed conflict, health issues, women, peace and security, and natural resources and conflicts. Some themes have been successful, as it were, uh, more successful than others. 
Now, as far as the WPS agenda is concerned, in resolutions notwithstanding, there have been tremendous challenges in its implementation. Critics have also expressed their reservations about the gender washing of interventionist policies of the Security Council. But my point again here is that WPS agenda is here to stay for better or for worse. And unlike a couple of other themes that I mentioned, subsequent WPS resolutions have continued to have their own title, that is Women and Peace and Security, and have not been subsumed under broader titles such as Maintenance of International Peace and Security or Peace and Security in Africa. That said, it is, which, which is something that has happened in the case of health, for instance. Now, that said, it is of interest that Resolution 2538, adopted in August this year, is primarily about women in peace operations. However, it was adopted not as a WPS resolution, uh, but as one on UN peacekeeping operations. And we were discussing this at a recent webinar whether this means that WPS has been main mainstreamed, so we don't really need to speak about it separately anymore, or using my reasoning earlier, that this has been sidelined in the Council's deliberations. Now, as an academic, I have the privilege to say that it is too soon to comment. But I would add here that gender remain Im important. So if you look at the controversial resolution on COVID-19 that was adopted on July 1st, it makes references to women's role in response efforts, uh, the disproportionate negative impact on women and girls, etc. So outside of the context of armed conflicts as well, member states are acknowledging the significance of women's experiences in council's work. This is obviously not the same as accounting for gender, women does is not equal to gender, but it is certainly part of it and possibly, just possibly, speaks to the concept of continuum of violence, which I referred to earlier. I now come to the final point regarding, to, regarding the gender dimensions of the Security Council, that is invocations of feminist foreign policy by a number of states across the world in recent year. This too has been linked to the WPS agenda it is famously associated with Swedish foreign policy, as Ambassador Puri discussed. This was during the tenure of Margot Wallstrom, and in its most famous iteration has been associated with the three R's, which were mentioned earlier, uh, which relate to equal representation of women in international politics, ensuring women's equal access to resources, and ensuring respect for women's rights. So this is not just about international peace and security, but can also be brought to bear upon development aid or a state's position on issues in multilateral settings. In a 2016 newspaper article, Ambassador Nirupama Rao had asked what a feminist foreign policy of South Asia would look like. And she wrote, and I quote her here, can we not consider a discourse that speaks of matters beyond war and peace? Peace in the South Asian subcontinent seems to be associated with white flags, surrender, submission, weakness. Do we think of a South Asia commons, not an arena for mutual jousting where we bait each other in blood sport, but a space for maturity of peaceful purpose, robust civility, and mutual accommodation? End quote. For practitioners of multilateral diplomacy, this sounds like an eminently sensible proposal and something that they actually practice, I would like to think. No doubt such efforts would be wrapped up in specific issues of national interest and shaped by what Vincent Pulio calls the international pecking order. But as I've argued elsewhere as well, we see gender appear as national interest in the Security Council. This is reflected, for instance, in references to gender policies and the WPS agenda in campaigns for a seat at the horseshoe table, as was the case with Australia, for instance, or decisions of elected member states to lead the adoption of a new WPS resolution. Resolution 1325, for instance, was adopted under the presidency of Namibia, and they have really left a lasting legacy, and they are mentioned every time. So. Uh, this is a good segue in the last uh, remaining last couple of minutes 
to briefly touch upon why what all of this might mean for india's upcoming term and again i'll make just three quick points first it would not be surprising to see wps feature in the range of issues that must be on india's to do list at the council from and I, the reason i say this is because there has been an evolution on india's policy in relation to this from suggesting at the wps open debate in 2000 that india supports women's participation in peace initiatives but not in peace operations because the latter would lead to feminization of violence to sending the first female form police unit to be deployed as part of the un mission in liberia in 2007 india has already covered some distance in this regard second speaking of women's participation in peace operations this is widely seen as um well india's primary if not sole engagement with the wps agenda while one of the key reasons given for this deployment was to curb sexual exploitation and abuse of women in conflict regions india has also emphasized within quotes capacity building and institution building at the ground level in its references internationally to women's involvement in conflict prevention it is this latter aspect that india can potentially take a lead on and this would be compatible with the delegation's focus on peace operations during its earlier terms on the council third and finally and i have more to say on this but we'll save that for the full paper or the discussion india would find common ground with critical feminist scholars who have raised questions about the council in relation to dominance of powerful states selective interventions and its position on use of force as i noted in yet another wps webinar recently feminist work on wps needs to inform and happen in conjunction with efforts to reform global institutions on peace and security this note may be useful for member states such as india that have called for restructuring the council for decades now thank you very much thank you so much for that uh, again very informative and uh, a um, very substantive understanding that you have presented of the women peace and security agenda uh and uh, how you would like um it to evolve as we know that is um, in in theory we have made great as a, as i said overall normatively speaking i don't think we can ask for much more in these 10 resolutions of uh, women peace and on on women peace and security and every time we keep adding uh, elements and new dimensions but substantially i think we have covered all the bases but the problem is of implementation problem is of how much value the uh, p5 first of all put and there is a division within that uh, which we can discuss uh and also the member states uh influential member states like india are going to advance that prioritize that and uh, leave a mark on that as you said so now we have come to the dialogue stage and uh, we welcome questions uh, so ankita are you receiving the questions how are you going to do this ma'am the questions are uh, visible on every panelist you can see there are two questions uh, one is addressed to dr sadik mm-hmm. and another one is addressed to dr naren so the question for dr sadik um, yeah why don't you start because i can't see yeah the dr sadik brought out the different strands of feminist ideal theory how would you respond to the criticism that such varying stands of feminist ir bring about more divisions within the theory itself uh, that's the question for uh, dr sadik and for dr naren uh, it's from dr sanjeev kumar and he says you have rightly talked about the methodolo- uh, methodological issues in feminist theories what is the relationship between conceptualizations of gender and different form of ir theories be it feminist or otherwise and whether choice or selection of methodology is going to impact the conceptualization of gender in significant or a drastic way okay 
So should I take up my question first? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So Mansi, uh, the girl, I think, has talked about how um, uh, varying strands of feminist IR brings about more division. First, most important thing about feminism is that it is against binaries. It's against dualism. So any strands which we theoretically we try to bring about are just to give an overview about what is known as feminism or different stand. That doesn't mean, as I very, uh, uh, very strictly mentioned in my presentation, that there's no single feminist approach to IR because they are interrelated to each other, even if they run into different directions. So feminism is about uh, beyond binaries. It criticizes binaries. It criticizes divisions or something as positive or negative. It's about you cannot call one thing as masculine, one thing as feminine, or the whole idea of active, passive, the whole thing about valuing one thing. So, but some amount of thematic divisions is important to address specific issues. The certain amount of essentialization becomes important because um, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, these different strands exist because they address certain issues which at that point of time became very important. If we were not talking about equal rights, maybe women would have not got what is known as vote, voting rights. So certain kind of liberalism in that sense was needed. If we did not reject a uh, social system or we did not reject certain binaries, maybe women uh, issues of women related to certain races, ethnicity, etc. is not important. So that criticism stays, but that to bring about certain clarity, to bring about a unifying effect, uh, Taking a lot different things from different stands becomes equally important. So we should not see them as clear cut divisions. They are very interrelating and they contribute to each other. So as a whole, we need to understand how they can move towards bringing a more uh, gender equal world rather than looking at them as different binaries or different strands or bringing in different. They do bring different perspectives, which is the perspective, for example, standpoint feminism takes a lot from uh, socialist feminist, also takes a lot from liberal also and says how women have a very different point of view. But uh, those divisions are not very clear cut. They are connected to each other and they also separately they contribute and in unity also they contribute. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I, I'd like to respond and, you know, maybe uh, make another point or two, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, um, our uh, relation to pedagogy uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of how we can weave what we've discussed with practitioners. So I, I'll take on the question and make one or two more comments uh, as well. Uh, well, firstly, methodology does, uh, you know, make uh, a lot of difference because uh, ultimately, uh, uh, A, it's about, you know, the coloniality of knowledge and, and, and the way that knowledge has been uh, sort of dominated uh, by Eurocentricism and uh, the way that IR has been written by, uh, you know, uh, giving the hegemonic dominance to rational choice. You are looking or interpreting, uh, you know, or conceptualizing things in a very narrow way. And the way that, you know, uh, coloniality of knowledge has worked out in IR theory, uh, that seems to be very militaristic and masculine, you know. So uh, women have been, uh, you know, uh, not only excluded, but never seen as, you know, uh, you know, somebody as having agency. So intersectionality, which really broadens the prism through which we see things, conceptualize things and form identities, uh, certainly broadens the, you know, compass uh, through which we uh, look and understand that things. So to my mind, methodology uh, does make, uh, you know, a lot of difference. Uh, and uh, the second point that I want to make is with regard to the incoherence of, you know, feminisms, uh, you know, we can take away something from that, you know, uh, the fact that feminism is not a unified, uh, you know, uh, approach and that there are, you know, varying types of feminisms because uh, interdisciplinarity brings in, uh, you know, a lot of 
other various dimensions through which we can, uh, you know, uh, understand issues. So, the intervention of sociology, the intervention of history, you know, all that matters. And ultimately, you know, uh, uh, all this should really filter down to uh, knowledge construction and how it gets circulated. How does it come into the booklets? You know, and it took a male scholar for uh, feminism's engagement, uh, you know, with IR uh, and the rebuttal that went on between Anne Tickner uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Robert uh, Cohen, uh, it took a male scholar. So that is the kind of masculinist control, uh, you know, uh, the discipline um, has had. Uh, so, you know, uh, methodology is very important and, and you know, uh, changes are coming about in that segment as well. And the last point, I think, which is, uh, uh, which I take away from the conference today, uh, you know, uh, with the excellent rendition that Ambassador Puri has given about the praxis of IR, because, you know, that, that, that gap also has to be narrowed. And here, what I suggest is that, uh, you know, uh, as pedagogy or pedagogical, you know, uh, structures or entities, because that's how, you know, knowledge gets created. It has to be accepted and it has to be circulated. Uh, I think we should also try to weave our uh, pedagogical, uh, you know, uh, uh, structures with practice by becoming activists also. So if you look at the work of Chandra, uh, you know, Talpade, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think she bring, brings, uh, you know, gender issues more to the forefront uh, because she encapsulates both theory, pedagogy, as well as, uh, you know, taking up uh, live cases of things that have happened on the ground, uh, not only to unravel these, you know, st uh, structures of hierarchy or gendered aspects, but also to look at where we can, by making different kind of questions, uh, bring to the forefront the agency of women. So, you know, uh, I think that is very important and, you know, that's what uh, I have to say. Thank you. Ma'am, there are a few more questions. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am, we have a few more questions. One is addressed to you. Um, mm -hmm. It's from Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. He said, you refer to homegrown feminism and South Asian feminism in your opening remarks. Could mm -hmm. you please further describe these ideas in the context of global feminism? Uh, then there are two questions which are addressed to uh, Dr. Basu. Uh, one, first the question is, ma'am, does the WPS agenda not reinforce stereotypical notions of women being associated with peace and men with war? And another question is, you mentioned the danger of WPS agenda being subsumed under other issues. Uh, you made a reference to peace and security in Africa. What do you foresee are the potential pitfalls of this? Uh, there's another question. I think it's uh, not technically targeted to anybody, uh, but it says, how can we also ensure that <laughs> gynocentric essentialism in the feminist theoretical approach becomes more inclusive? to bring in other communities like LGBTQI and the youth. This is addressed to whom? Uh, Ma'am, this is not addressed to anybody. So anybody who would like to answer this. We'll need to get another readout on that because it's a long question. So uh -huh. any yeah. Okay. It says, how can we also ensure mm. that gynocentric essentialism in the feminist theoretical approach becomes more inclusive? to bring mm. in other communities like LGBTQI and youth. Mm. Okay, so let me respond to uh, the question about uh, South Asian um, uh, feminism and, um, uh, as, as an, and its contribution to global f feminism. I think, uh, first of all, uh, there is this um, uh, the issue of experience, experiential contribution, which is really very essential in in the uh, both the theory and practice of feminism. And that's what South Asia has provided, whether it is India or Bangladesh or uh, other other South Asian countries, including, I would say, Pakistan, there has been a very uh, direct uh, articulation 
of what women's uh, condition is, their status is, what are their key um, concerns, uh, and how, what change do they require in in the in in the power structures, in in political uh, participation and leadership, voice and leadership. For example, the issue of um, uh, girl um, aversion and boy uh, preference. Now that is very central to South Asian uh, perceptions of uh, gender uh, of feminism. How do we change that mindset? The second uh, aspect is, of course, the uh, the poverty and development aspect. As you know, even in the South Asian Tark uh, context, uh, it is classified as a social uh, cooperation issue. But even within that, the whole issue of the fact of feminization of, of uh, poverty, uh, the concept of uh, uh, how the, the intersectionality in South Asia, you have issues of caste, you have issues of rural, urban, uh, and, and tribal, and all of those intersectionalities that have an impact on uh, the larger issue of gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, the third aspect uh, that South Asia, uh, I think some of you referred to uh, as very essentially as um, uh, or issues of um, uh, environment, climate, the global public goods that have been um, very much contributed to. The thinking on that has been contributed to by women feminists uh, and thinkers and women economists. I think th that that uh, feminist economists and feminist environmentalists, uh, that contribution has been very, very significant, um, both as uh, feminist theorists, but also in practice. Uh, so we have many activists on the ground. And I think that's a combination which is very, very important uh, to have both uh, feminists conceptualizing, intrude, in, invading uh, the larger uh, inherited conceptual spaces and theories as we are just now doing and thinking about whether it's international relations, whether it's development, whether it is uh, peace and war, all of that. And then within that, to make sure to integrate uh, gender equality and to situate it also from a very practical uh, uh, perspective which people can relate to, not only women and women and girls, but also other stakeholders. And I think the importance of men and boys, youth, uh, you know, the generational leap that we need to make. I think youth are a big uh, means of leapfrogging into uh, gender equality. So all of that, even our, uh, we have very, very, very uh, strong young women feminists, as well as, as I said, if we can grow the young men feminist movement, that would also be uh, a great contribution that South Asia can make to uh, global fem feminism. But it has already made. And also, I think the networking and leadership in global feminism, because sometimes of, uh, you know, we are, um, we, we, you know, somebody referred to gender equality as a, a white man's mission uh, with a we, um, uh, brown men or, or black men or, or, or whatever it. So there is this uh, important uh, contribution that South Asia really has a very strong leadership role in global fem feminism. I, it can stand tall vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Western uh, feminists. And uh, also, uh, I think they have been able to influence global feminism to look at issues of development in a more equitable way. So there has been a lot of osmosis between uh, uh, Western feminism and global feminism, so-called global fem feminism, and what South Asia has contributed.
would anybody like to respond to the uh, other question there are few questions for uh, dr basu as well yeah thank you uh, ankita and uh, thank you ambassador puri um i realize that i stand between uh, our participants and lunch so i'll keep my responses short um so i have questions from jayshree and uh, manasi uh, i'll answer jayshree first um the reason why uh, in in some of the literature it suggested that it's not a good idea for wps to be subsumed un, uh, or and un, un, resolutions to be passed under other uh, you know bigger themes is because um, it would then take away from the focus so something like natural resources and conflicts which was adopted under maintenance of international peace and security you don't hear it as much whereas women and peace and security has its own place in the agenda so that name helps uh, so that is a rather short response to your question regarding manasi's uh, question uh yes indeed there are dangers to uh this so i should note that the first resolution 1325 it actually does talk about ddr which is uh disarmament demobilization and reintegration uh in relation to female combatants so it takes account of that role um that said and i'll adopt a slightly flippant note here and say that i almost wish that women were associated with peace a little bit more because then we would have more women in the intra afghan talks uh you mm -hmm. so this not actually happening in practice um and the other dimension of this is also what the wps agenda has done is that it has allowed us to look at men and boys differently as well so at this point uh the a lot of there's been some critique of the fact that the resolutions in fact the focus has been on looking at women as victims of conflict related sexual violence which is important but it should not dominate the agenda um and so uh, uh, an association of women as peacemakers and taking that forward concretely would be very welcome but going back to my point about men and boys resolution 2106 uh, on women and peace and security actually talks about men and boys being survivors of conflict related sexual violence as well and recognizes that and that's extremely important so we are beginning to see uh, uh, multiple dimensions of this so of course more work needs to be done and very quickly uh, in response to abhishek's question again thank you and the Uh, the one word answer to this would be intersectionality that would be a way to uh, see how this all comes together in in specific uh, context thank you again thank you all very much uh, do we now wrap up this panel and uh, thank you uh, it has been indeed uh, a very educated enlightening educative and i think path breaking uh, discussion that we have had i have not seen uh, such a confluence of thinking on international relations and feminist theories of international feminist theories themselves and feminist uh, theories on international relations how the two can be interlinked and how we can transform international relations related theories uh into gender mainstreamed ones i i want to use that term and earlier i had referred to this whole concept of gender mainstreaming as as a path breaking concept because i know we have been using gender sensitive international relations what does that mean gender sensitivity is that you are aware of the implications of uh gender whether in terms of voice participation and leadership in decision making or that you are actually taking issues uh, that are uh, of a core interest to women into account and you are actually responding to that so sensitivity is one thing and that's the first level and that's very important to make international relations gender sensitive but it's important also to go beyond awareness to be responsive and that's why we talk about gender responsiveness of policies of programs 
of approaches of the basic uh, you know the, the the vision that you have for any foreign policy or for international relations so i think that and then gender mainstreaming means in trying to be gender responsive how do you specifically target uh policies and programs within say in this case foreign policy or international relations to uh respond to the gender equality uh women's empowerment concerns and and priorities to what extent do you prioritize that to what extent do you uh demonstrate through the participation of women leadership in and and in the in the formulation of foreign policy in the formulation of and conduct of international relations where do you place women power uh so all of that is is very very important and you have really um identified different elements the other uh takeaway for me was uh, that the gender uh, relative gender blindness of existing international relations theories and how we need to transform them and some of you gave very good ideas on how we should um uh, really infiltrate this uh universe of uh, international relations theory and how in in practice also how do we substantiate because i think um like in the women peace and security agenda we have had and un women did a global study in uh, 2015 trying to make the case why women matter why does what value do we add it's not of course the it's of course the gender justice thing to do but what value do we add and i think all of you and that's the other part which has been very enlightening all of you highlighted what is the value that women bring whether it is to war and peace whether it is to development to economic negotiations or diplomacy and foreign policy uh as as they do to national economy to to societies etc and this whole uh, you know values of consensus building of um, uh, non conflictual uh, conduct and and um, not having toxic masculinities intervene in uh, peace making and peace building all of that i think is a very important um, value addition to uh the the quality of um foreign policy making for an and its conduct in diplomacy the other um uh, very important uh, point that came through is that the feminist theories are uh, as was pointed out they are not bind they are not uh, binary there are multiple strands and we have had this actually conversations several times not only in the context of international relations we have sometimes uh, regretted the fact that we as feminists are divided in terms of our uh, multiple uh, uh, theories but i think it's a many splendid uh, thing to have all these different strands as you have rightly said and but also to say how they are interrelated that there is a, a connected universe of this the third aspect i think which you uh, and i i also would like very much to uh, emphasize is that gender fits into you choose your theories of international relations and we can fit gender into it so that's that's my very strong and that's what i refer to as turbocharging uh, the variable geometry of uh, through the variable geometry of of feminism to turbocharge international relations into more inclusive more effective um uh, vehicle of uh, achieving the as i said the humanities for projects the other aspect uh, i would really want to also emphasize is uh, the intersectionality and interdisciplinary uh, nature of uh, feminist uh, theories but also of the value they bring to international relations and diplomacy 
that this intersectionality and uh, interdisciplinary nature and that should be again used as um, a leverage plus i think um, there should be as i pointed out greater interaction between the disciplines of international relations and diplomacy whether they, it is disarmament or uh, development or or trade uh, you, um, you know i've, I've had in human rights so whatever areas but there should be greater uh, inter uh, disciplinary uh, interaction with uh, these other disciplines uh, then of course the gaps i think all of you referred our opening speakers also referred to the gaps both in uh, the actual uh, the theories you know we talked about the blindness but also in the actual practice of international relations and those gaps we need to fill having more foreign minister i think i have given i don't want to repeat i've i've given those six points which i hope will be uh, taken forward to including in the south asian context uh, and uh, i think we need to fill those gaps um, as a priority if we want to really engender uh, international relations and uh, also the whole issue of um, uh, the uh, theory i know today we have had a very strong um, an in depth discussion on the theories but also i want to say that sometimes if we go too much into theory we lose our focus on practice and the linkage between practice and theory is very important and that's why i began and i emphasized in my statement the importance of recognizing that all these theories have in some way or the other been already incorporated in what i call the international uh new international feminist order at the un level at the global level you have a normative uh inclusion of all these different ideas feminist ideas and a to do list for governments in each of these areas so i would say those who are working in academia in the area of feminism and international relations please try to link up with what is already the body of soft law the practice that is already there and also then last but not least i think we need to see how these theories are going to support a strengthening of an updating of uh, international relations uh, you know tech tech, tech economy 4.0 is my uh, you know present preoccupation i have written a lot about it but also from the gender perspective how is it going to affect countries and how are the new international rules of the game wsis i was very much involved in that, those negotiations and uh, we try to bring in the gender perspective there is a digital gap there is a even uh, in all of the technology there is a technological gap between uh, in in uh, between men and women and stem gap all of those areas how do we in the new rules of the game that we establish nationally and internationally how do we ensure that women that gap is not only bridged but that they are able to in fact use this to leapfrog into a new uh, era on uh, of of gender equal uh, world so these are some of the very important uh, issues that have been brought up and certainly for me it has been uh, a learning and i thank all our um, very um, uh, dedicated and uh, uh, long experienced uh academics who have participated uh in this discussion for their contribution and uh, i do hope that we can have more uh, interaction between uh you and our uh south asian um foreign ministries and sark context uh, you know and through your institution 
um, I think to grow that um, solidarity on uh, this on, on feminization, if I may say, of international relations and and foreign policy. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, and um, uh, I, I really hope that um, this is not going to be a one-off initiative, but that you are going to continue to press on this point uh, and on on uh, engendering the strategic space that you have really taken a very far-sighted initiative on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair and Speakers. We will now take a lunch break and join back at 1400 hours. Thank you. Thank you.